next presenter. Oh, also, like I said, um, y'all's questions have been amazing. Please keep them coming. You can type into the Q&A section as the presenter is speaking and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, y'all's questions have been amazing, like I said. All right, our next speaker is a Nashville native that started her professional career in early childhood education. She taught elementary school for nearly five years before returning to graduate school to study public health. She's the director of the Tobacco Use Prevention and Control Program within the section of Family Health and Wellness at the Tennessee Department of Health. As director of the tobacco program, Liz oversees the Tennessee Tobacco Quit Line, Baby and Me Tobacco Free Program, and the Tobacco Use Prevention and Control Program efforts for all 95 counties across the state. Prior to her role as director of the tobacco program, she was the executive director at the Sumner County Anti-Drug Coalition. Liz has also worked with the refugee and immigrant population in, middle, in the Middle Tennessee area in health promotion and diabetes self-management. Liz holds an MPH from Walden University and is a certified prevention specialist. She lives in Hendersonville with her husband and five-year-old twin daughters. In her spare time, she enjoys reading, cooking, and being outdoors. Her, the name of her presentation is Tobacco Prevention and Control in Tennessee. Welcome to Tobacco Nation. So please help me welcome Liz Johnson. Thank you, Liz. Hello, everybody. Can you all hear me? And I don't sound like a frightening, yes. does my sound okay? Yes, you sound great. Fantastic. Also, um, just wanted to check on my slide deck to make sure you are seeing the right thing. Um, you can't see my notes or anything. Just want to make sure that so you're not uh, following along as I'm as I'm going. We set. Hey, Liz. We don't see your PowerPoint. Oh, hang on, just a second. Then, sorry about that. You don't see it. No. Because I didn't share it. Sorry about <laughs> that. I forgot to click share. That's important. Except you're seeing the wrong thing again. Hang on one second, guys. I'm sorry. Bear with me. Today has been a real um, interesting day for technology. For There we go. How about now? Yes. <laughs> awesome. Appreciate your patience. Um, thanks so much for that. Um, really great introduction. And I, I really appreciate um, the opportunity to be here. Um, so yes, my name is Liz Johnson. I'm the director of the Tobacco Prevention and Control Program at the Tennessee Department of Health. Really thankful to have this opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, this is an opportunity for me to talk with you all about a substance that's often lower on a lot of people's priority list um, to address. Tobacco use and dependence is something that often gets really pushed to the side as a substance that is either less deadly or less harmful or looked at that way. Um, so hopefully today I can shift your thinking about why it's really important that we address tobacco use and dependence now. Um, as public health professionals, healthcare providers, treatment specialists, friends, family members, whatever you may be, um, if you know a smoker or have a smoker or tobacco user in your life, um, it's really time that we start addressing tobacco now, tobacco dependence now, in conjunction with treatment of other substances. There we go. Um, so I want to uh, just go over quickly my learning objectives or your learning objectives today and, um, and what we're gonna be um, talking through with this presentation. Um, so I really want to focus on understanding the tobacco prevention and control landscape here in Tennessee um, in comparison with the rest of the nation. Um, also really important is, is recognizing how uh, different populations are really disproportionately affected by tobacco and tobacco use. Um, understanding how 
uh, healthcare provider intervention, um, there's such a need for it and why it's so important. It plays a huge role in, in people um, quitting tobacco for good. Um, and then how you can assist others, maybe if you're not a healthcare provider, if you were just a, um, a regular citizen, or if you have friends, family members, um, how you can assist quit, um, a user's quit attempt using evidence-based strategies. So we'll go through some, some different options for, um, for cessation materials and, and programs that are available. So I really want to talk through this first piece that some of you may have heard of, this term called Tobacco Nation. Um, there are 13 states that have been dubbed Tobacco Nation. Um, if you can see on your screen, there is that orange section that's been highlighted in the, um, on the map. And, and this, is, uh, this was a study done by Truth, uh, Truth Initiative. Um, but there are these 13 states. The states include um, Alabama. I feel like I should be singing the state song right now. Alabama, Arkansas, Indiana, Kentucky, Louisiana, Michigan, Mississippi, Missouri, Ohio, Oklahoma, West Virginia, South Carolina, and of course, Tennessee. Um, so today we're going to discuss the similarities among those Tobacco Nation states um, and some of the things, some of the barriers that um, we as one of those states face. And um, it, it's really, uh, it's pretty shocking. And just to know that um, tobacco is still so prevalent here in our state. And, and so, um, you know, it, it's often just kind of disregarded as a substance that we should be um, focusing on working on, on folks getting, um, getting off of. So Tobacco Nation not only has smoking rates that are well above the national average, um, but they have rates that exceed um, you know, those of many countries, like it's, it's astronomical, the amount of the prevalence of smoking, um, adult smoking um, in, in those states. Um, so while U.S. smoking rates are on, on a decline, really, they've been on decline for the better part of two decades, um, things have gotten a lot worse for Tobacco Nation. In the year 2000, um, the national smoking rate um, for youth, so when I say this, I, I'm really talking about combustible cigarettes. Um, that the national rate was 23%. And then in 2019, the rate had dropped all the way down to 5%. And, and I'm not talking about e-cigarette use at this time, really just looking at, at combustible cigarette use. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, tobacco is not an equal opportunity killer. In many communities, especially in Tobacco Nation, um, we've not experienced the same reduction in tobacco use. So Tobacco Nation states all have these the same similar, similar characteristics and the cards are really stacked against these states um, and, and us as you know, Tennesseans and, and being uh, right here in the middle of um, Tobacco Nation, it's no different for us. So 21% of Tobacco Nation adults smoke compared to those uh, about 15% of adults in the rest of the United States. Um, and, and really not all, um, not all adults um, living in the rest of the country um, have the same barriers. They don't, you know, we, we face different barriers here in Tobacco Nation. And, and so we're gonna talk about that now um, in, in moving forward in the next few slides. Um, but also people living in Tobacco Nation earn a, a much, lower, um, much lower wages and, uh, you know, they, their incomes are, are far lower than those of um, adults living in the rest of the country. So about 25% less per year um, income uh, difference there. Um, and then also they have overall poor health outcomes. And that's really attributed to um, infrastructure and healthcare resources. So Tobacco Nation residents report 20% uh, more poor physical and mental health days than the average American. Um, and finally, <clears throat> the real, you know, this, this uh, the whole, um, one of the major issues I should say that Tobacco Nation states face are really a lack of tobacco control policies. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that here on the next slide as well. Um, but there are only two states in Tobacco Nation that have laws forbidding smoking in workplaces and restaurants and bars compared to more than half of the states in the rest of the country. Um, so really strong policies and ensuring that, um, that places uh, protect people from secondhand smoke exposure, um, those those things don't exist nearly at, um, at, you know, as frequently in tobacco nation states as they do um, in the other parts of the country. 
So we've been talking, uh, I, I've been talking a little bit about uh, tobacco nation, you know, in, in all of those states that we, you know, are um, kind of lumped into, but I want to look at some of the barriers and, and talk with you guys about some of the barriers that we have in tobacco control and prevention um, here in Tennessee. So there is this annual report that American Lung Association puts out. Um, you can access it just by going to their website. You can also Google state of tobacco control um, if you're interested in, in kind of digging into it more um, and doing some comparisons. But as you can see on your screen, um, Tennessee scored an F grade across the board, except for for smoke-free air. And we're going to talk about that here a little bit and give you some of the of the issues, the barriers we see um, now. So we, we received an F for tobacco control funding. Um, and tobacco control funding is just a chronically underfunded program. Um, and when I when I talk about that program, it's it's my program um, here at the Department of Health. Um, it's CDC recommends that Tennessee should receive more than $76 million annually to address tobacco use in the state. 76 million, it's a recommendation. It's astronomical, we understand that, but it's certainly a recommendation. And that's based on um, population size, the amount of smokers in the state, um, uh, socioeconomics, different, different um, things play into why they provide that recommendation. Um, mostly it's because we have a very high smoking prevalence across the state. Um, just for perspective, for the year, for fiscal year 21, my program received zero dollars to address tobacco prevention in the state. So um, I know that that was in large part due to COVID-19. Um, we were put into the budget and then pulled out at the last minute because of COVID. Um, so we, we understood that for sure. Um, the good news is there is a little silver lining here that the program will is written into the budget for this year that hasn't been voted on yet. Um, you will receive $2 million um, for fiscal year 22. So little silver lining there. Um, $2 million really doesn't go very far, but we can certainly make it work. That's better than $0. Um, so another barrier that we, we face here in Tennessee is, is smoke-free air. And actually we received a D grade, which is a little step up not great, but the reason behind that is really um, uh, because we have some smoking restrictions. So smoking is prohibited on um, in government workplaces, private workplaces, schools, recreational and cultural facilities, um, and retail stores. Now, when it comes to restaurants and bars, it's restricted. Um, smoking is still allowed um, in bars that are 21 and up if the proprietor allows it. Um, so that kind of is, it's on a case by case basis. Um, so if you do go into a restaurant or a bar and it, there's smoking in there and you think um, that you've stepped back in time 20 years, it's actually that it is allowed still if the proprietor um, has a 21 and up establishment. Um, the next thing we received an F grade on is tobacco taxes. So we have a 62 cent um, tax on combustible cigarettes. There are no taxes on e-cigarettes in the state of Tennessee at this time. Also, I will just note that there was a bill signed into law on um, March 31st of this year that was effective immediately that removed all of the taxes on smokeless tobacco products. So that includes chew, dip, and snus, and products of the like. So currently, we are ranked 43rd in the nation out of 50 states um, for, for lowest uh, tobacco uh, taxes. Um, it is, it is a proven, studied, there is about 50 years, probably 60 or so years now, more of, of evidence around tobacco prevention and control. And the absolute um, most uh, proven way to reduce tobacco use and decrease tobacco use is by raising taxes. And so um, low taxes or no taxes is certainly um, a problem that we face here in Tennessee and why our prevalence rate is still so high. Um, also, uh, F in access to cessation services, there are lots of barriers to coverage for cessation medication and counseling services. Um, the average investment per smoker, like the median for other states, is $2.28. Tennessee invests 46 cents per smoker. Uh, and the last thing I'll say about this report card, I promise it's not going to be all doom and gloom throughout this entire presentation. Um, but the last thing I'll say about this report card is 
Uh, we received an F for flavored tobacco products, and that is because there is currently no state law or regulation against flavored tobacco products. Um, and then I'll just throw this out there. I said 43rd earlier for, for taxes. We are also ranked 43rd um, in the nation for overall tobacco use, according to America's health rankings. Um, so it's, it's not a great outlook for tobacco use in Tennessee. So I don't want to talk a whole lot about the data. Well, the next couple of slides are kind of about the data and, and prevalence across the state. Um, and it's important, but, but we'll talk some more about why this is happening um, a little later in the presentation. Um, so the map that you see on the screen now um, depicts the smoking rates in Tennessee. And I've highlighted the larger cities in the state. Um, as you can see, if you can see that little legend at the bottom, um, the best is lighter and the worst is darker. So as you can see, the, the larger cities actually have significantly lighter colors, um, meaning that the rate of adult smoking is, is quite a bit lower than in the more rural parts of the state. As you see, we've got um, Shelby County, about 20%, Davidson County, which is, uh-oh, I haven't moved in my office in a minute. The light just turned off, I'm sorry. Um, Davidson County is, is about 18%, uh, Hamilton County, 19%, and Knox County, about 20%. So that doesn't sound too terrible, right? I mean, you think it's pretty low, but when you compare our numbers to the national average, the national average is, is about 14% of adult smokers. Um, Tennessee's best performing county is Williamson County um, and their rate is 15%. So even our best performing county still has a, a higher rate than what the national average is. Um, we can make assumptions all day long about why the numbers in the metro areas are lower than in those rural areas. Uh, one is that the access to healthcare and resources is really greater in those metro areas. Um, a lot of rural counties may have one health department or one clinic and that's it for the entire county. Um, so that's a real barrier for sure. Um, they also, you know, transportation is also a problem often. So. Um, those are some of the, the assumptions that we can make about why those numbers are higher or lower um, in the rural areas um, versus the metro areas. So this, I'm going to show you this last kind of map. It sort of looks like a heat map, um, but this is really drilling down into Shelby County. Um, according to the behavioral health, uh, I'm sorry, the, it, we call it BRFIS, it's Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. Um, in 2019, the Memphis Metropolitan Statistical Area, which includes Memphis and then some smaller surrounding portions of Arkansas and Mississippi, um, they had an estimated smoking rate of 17.7%. Um, this estimate is not statistically different from the general population rate of 19.9%. Um, and it's mainly due to the sample size. It is, however, statistically higher than the national median of 16%. Um, on a statewide level, non-Hispanic Black Tennesseans smoke approximately at the same rate as, as of 20.5% as non-Hispanic White Tennesseans of 19.6%. So we're really hovering there between 19 and 20%. Um, so this map, the map that you see and the legend suggests that some parts, so um, if you look at the, the, the darker areas on your screen are the ones, or is where smoking prevalence is higher. Um, and if you can't tell, I'll get my pointer here, um, Memphis is here on the map. Oh, nope, there we go, there it is on your map. So um, just to give you perspective there, if you can't tell um, where it is on your screen. Um, and it really suggests that some parts of Shelby County experience higher smoking rates than others. Um, these are estimates and they're model-based uh, rather than survey-based. So, um, it, you know, despite, um, you know, there's a lot of national research that demonstrates that despite smoking fewer cigarettes than white Americans, black Americans are much more likely to die from smoking related diseases. So we're talking cancer and COPD and um, all the other smoking related illnesses, uh, heart disease, um, all of those things, um, black Americans are much more likely to die from those tobacco related illnesses than their white counterparts. So while it's really important 
um, to look at the data and understand smoking prevalence. And, and we do that. We, we look at the data, we, we, and that's how we, how we decide what programs need to go where and what parts of the state. We know that what we can do in Shelby County is certainly not gonna be the same as we do all the way in East Tennessee and, and Sullivan County. So um, data really helps us at the Department of Health um, drive decisions, drive programming, and determine you know, where our funding needs to go. Um, so it's really important to look at the data, but then we also have to understand um, and look at the drivers of tobacco-related disparities. So we're gonna spend a good bit of time talking about what tobacco-related disparities are, and then um, some of those drivers. So what are tobacco-related uh, tobacco health disparities? Um, they are um, really the differences uh, in health stemming from tobacco use and exposure. Um, they are certainly, there are certainly groups that face disadvantage at a higher rate than, than others. Um, and we're looking at, we're talking about African-Americans, Native Americans, um, those people who identify as LGBTQ, people with lower socio socioeconomic status, and then folks who have a mental and behavioral health diagnosis. So um, those groups, um, as, a as the Department of Health Tobacco Program, we look at those groups as our target populations um, and really determine, um, start with those groups as to who needs who needs to be addressed as far as what services are available, what services are being provided, what partners are addressing these groups and how we can um, diversify funding and all of those things. So these are the groups that we are um, really focused on ensuring that we get services and, um, and information and materials out to. Um, and tobacco related health disparities are really a result from the differences in, in use and it's, it's a social and environmental thing. There are such inequalities um, socially and environmentally among those populations. Um, and it really affects how people um, use um, tobacco, whether it's they smoke menthol or they, they use chew and dip and snooze and all those different products. So um, there are some real differences in, in tobacco related disparities among these groups. So I'm going to spend some time on this slide, and, and I hope that you all, um, if you take nothing else away from this, really listen to, to the kind of the drivers and the reasons behind this disparity. Um, it's, it's pretty shocking and astonishing to hear some of the things that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, so the, the tobacco industry targets disparate populations, like I mentioned, African-American, LGBTQ, um, Native American uh, groups, um, folks with low socioeconomic status, all of these people are targeted directly by the tobacco industry. And there are real um, parallels between um, how the industry targets African Americans and the LGBTQ population and low income individuals. So they, they use a lot of the same tactics um, to target these groups. Uh, for today's presentation, I'm going to really focus on the African-American population. I am going to link, actually, on the end, at the end of my slide deck, there are a few articles um, and some other resources that will provide some information about um, how the LGBTQ population is, is targeted. Also, some uh, resources for addressing tobacco addiction among people living with behavioral and, uh, and or mental health disorders. Um, and then just some other um, resources that I thought were interesting and could be helpful. So one way that, um, that the industry targets um, specifically the African-American population is through advertising. Um, they do event sponsorships. One example, in June of last year in 2020, um, we were in the middle of the Black Lives Matter movement. Altria, who is the parent company of Marlboro Cigarettes, donated $5 million to black organizations at the peak of the Black Lives Matter protest in an effort to diffuse the growing scrutinization that tobacco companies and their considerable role in pushing for tobacco use among black Americans. So they decided to make themselves look good and provide this money um, to, to the Black Lives Matter movement really to say, we're not doing this, we're really not, but in, in turn, we're actually advertising at all of these events um, and really pushing their products on, on black Americans. The other thing that they do is they intertwine smoking and cultural spaces. So in bars, 
um, specifically, for example, um, or other gathering places, tobacco companies often own alcohol companies as well. So those two substances are often um, promote, heavily promoted and pushed together by the same parent company. So they get more bang for their buck, obviously, if it's the same, the same company um, really pushing two different substances for their own company. One other thing that they do, um, they court community leaders and advocates. Um, they provide funding for HBCUs. They target, as many of you know, a couple of years ago, Jewel provided funding directly to Meharry um, for research purposes. Um, and there was a big uproar about that. Taking funding um, for research from the tobacco industry is not always something that is, is looked highly upon. So they definitely received some backlash for that, but that's what the industry does. They take organizations, they take um, companies who might, you know, they know that they need the money, they prey on them and they will provide financial support in return for um, advertising on a college campus. Um, you know, going to the college campus and offering discounts and coupons and um, and various ways to get young people or or old people, for that matter, addicted to their products. And so they're very sneaky about the way they do it. Sure, we'll give you five million dollars or X amount of dollars if you let us come on your campus or into your business um, and advertise our products. They also offer financial support to African American publications, magazines, and other media. Um, there's an image on your screen that you see, and those are actually all older um, menthol um, advertisements that thankfully um, combustible cigarette advertisement has been outlawed since the 70s. Maybe it was the 80s. I have to check my date again. Um, but there are still they are still very much allowed to um, advertise for um, electronic devices. And um, you will see that those older ads will kind of, they've been um, kind of reused and, and used for, um, combust, uh, excuse me, electronic devices. So let me just give you a quick idea as to how much money the industry spends um, on advertising alone. So as I mentioned before, the annual tobacco control budget, we get about $2 million. Actually, our annual budget is $2.1 million for, for the tobacco prevention program. The tobacco industry spends the equivalent amount in three days on advertising just in Tennessee. So they spend $2.1 million every three days in Tennessee just on advertising. And they concentrate this advertising in communities that are at high risk and are very vulnerable. So this is not, you know, they spend extra money on coupons. They spend extra money on, um, on courting these community leaders. They, they, they only spend that money on, on advertising of tobacco products in Tennessee. That's it. Um, so marketing, all of those things, billboards all over the state. Um, it's, it's astonishing to me that they, that they spend that much money. So we really, as a prevention program, we will never be able to go to bat and, and really, um, you know, meet the amount of, of um, promotion and things that they do. Um, it's, you know, we'll never have enough money to, to fight them. Um, but, you know, it's, they're, they're not going away, unfortunately. Um, all of this, though, is made possible through an incredibly complex and exhaustive research strategy. So they take, they take, um, they look at culture, they look at the demographics of people, they look at daily habits, even the biochemistry. So get this, guys, all the way down, they look at how much menthol is ideal for new smokers and what the color palette evokes, you know, the strongest um, positive reaction to their marketing efforts. They are masters of advertising and manipulation. Um, so if you're not mad about it yet, you should be. Um, the other things that we can talk about, um, you know, kind of briefly are community specific stressors. So we know that um, there are individual and intersectional stressors as well. And these are other disparities, you know, that folks, um, deal with on a daily basis. Work and home life are, you know, stress and and um, COVID has certainly, um, you know, increased smoking rates and definitely decreased calls to the Tennessee Tobacco Quit Line. So um, those are some things. Also poverty and racism and sexism. These are all reasons um, that we can note that are behind the disparity. Lack of access to health care 
in social norms. Social norms. The, the tobacco industry has targeted African Americans and strategically looked at mark, you know, marketed its products to the uh, to appeal to the community for decades. Most specifically with menthol, which is easier to smoke and harder to quit. <sighs> so I know thus far all of my slides have been really kind of doom and gloom and um, about the tobacco issues in the state. Um, in the next few slides, I'm going to spend some time really talking about um, what healthcare providers can do, um, op different opportunities to engage patients, and then other ways that you can assist smokers using evidence-based services and strategies. So improving and updating clinical practice guidelines, we, you know, those are, that's one thing that we know that healthcare providers can do. If your guidelines are not up to snuff and you're not um, doing some of the things that I'm going to talk through here in a few minutes. Um, it's certainly something to look into. We know that clinical intervention works. Um, even brief advice from a provider increases the chance that a patient will try to quit. Um, providing tobacco cessation support increases patient satisfaction and it, with care. So that's also a very proven thing that even if you just offer that support, patients are, you know, their satisfaction goes up. Um, we also know that counseling and medication can actually, that one-two punch of, of counseling, whether it be phone counseling from the quit line or counseling as a pro healthcare provider, along with that medication can actually double a patient's chance of quitting. Um, providing tobacco dependence treatment is reimbursable and is covered as a preventative service. So um, if you're a healthcare provider and you're not providing cessation, um, you know, treatment, um, it's certainly something that, that you should dig into. Um, advice, um, advising quitting and offering treatment, you know, that's asking every single patient about their tobacco use at every visit. Um, offering patients who, um, who use tobacco help with quitting. So I think, I think sometimes it, it falls off the radar or, um, you know, you ask once and then I'm also not a healthcare provider. So these are just some tips that I think are certainly um, helpful to keep in mind as you're working with patients who do smoke. So um, advising them who smoke, patients who smoke, that quitting really is one of the most important things they can do for their health, um, truly because smoking impacts uh, nearly every organ in the body. Um, so, you know, I, I think it, it doesn't matter if you're going to offer, you know, I think obviously we all want to use evidence-based services. Um, and that counseling and medication, if you um, think that someone needs an additional piece of help, certainly referring them to the quit line or another, um, a texting service that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, I don't think at all that taking away, I don't think that the quit line should be in place of, of using, uh, you know, healthcare services. If, um, if you're providing counseling and, um, and medication, I think certainly it's important to also consider um, if they need an extra support piece, that that's something to use. Um, following up with them, making sure that they're, you know, how their process is going. Um, and then every quit attempt is a closer, is one step closer to quitting. I have, I have met so many people who have um, attempted to quit and attempted to quit and tried and tried and tried again and keep falling back into it. And I think it's really crucial that we just continue to support those people, whether a healthcare provider, a friend, a family member, what have you. Um, helping, um, helping your patients um, with every quit attempt. So here's something else to consider. There are seven FDA approved um, quit medications, uh, FDA approved uh, nicotine replacement therapies on the market. Um, I'm not talking about e-cigarettes either because they are not approved for cessation um, at this time. So. Um, I think looking at medication combinations, um, if one medication doesn't work, maybe the patch doesn't work for somebody because the, um, the adhesive gives them a rash, or maybe they've tried Chantix and it didn't work for them either. There are seven options. And I think, um, I know it's hard because, uh, you know, with healthcare coverage being different for all kinds of folks, but um, it's really important to look into what the options are and try different things. Um, also trying to um, new approaches for handling different triggers. Um, I think it's really important. Last thing I'll say on this, and then I'll, I'll move on to the next um, part of this, is it takes 
um, someone between eight and 11 attempts to successfully quit smoking, eight and 11. So um, if they quit for a month and then they slip up and fall down and then um, smoke, you know, a couple of cigarettes on the weekend and then they, you know, I'm gonna quit again. So it could take eight to 11 tries over someone's lifetime before they actually quit. So keep that in mind the next time that you are working with a smoker and you're really getting down about the fact that they haven't actually quit yet, it's gonna, it could take them a, a very long time to, uh, to be successful. So this, this is some info that maybe if you are not a healthcare provider, but you're a, um, you know, a friend or a family member, I think it's really important to remember that um, you, you, if you're a smoker too, or not even a smoker, but a tobacco user, um, if you use dip, chew, snooze, or electronic devices, um, I think it's important to try to make a, t a quit attempt together. Uh, if you are dieting and trying to lose weight and you have an accountability partner, um, same, same sort of thing, keeping someone on track or being, being their support partner, um, it, it's, it can mean the world to someone who's trying to quit and having that positive um, person work, working with them. Um, celebrating small successes, like I mentioned on the last one with healthcare providers, really trying to avoid criticism if they slip. Um, and then suggesting other programs. I mentioned the quit line. I'll talk about that for just a second here. Um, there are other programs too, texting services. There are um, apps that we'll talk about too, but the quit line is a totally free service for all Tennesseans. It costs zero dollars to the caller. Um, it offers two weeks of free NRT for anyone who is 18 and older. Um, someone who is 13 and older can actually call. We've had several young people now calling who are addicted to electronic devices. Um, they cannot receive nicotine replacement therapy until they're 18 years old, but they can call and receive um, phone counseling. We know too that young people are not really very apt to using, um, picking up a phone and talking to someone about their problems. So we also have some texting services available. I'll mention in just a second. So with the quit line, um, it offers two weeks of free uh, nicotine replacement therapy. Um, the caller will receive five proactive counseling calls. And these, um, the people that they are calling are master's level counselors. They're tobacco treatment specialists, so they know their stuff. They know what they're doing. They've been trained to do this work. Um, and then they also receive, they're eligible for up to one year of phone counseling after the first five calls. So if you're not into calling and getting counseling, smokefree.gov um, has some very specific texting um, services and options available for various populations. Um, they have a uh, smoke-free veterans, um, smoke-free woman, smoke-free mom, also, there is an LGBTQ um, smoke-free, it's a different website, but it's, um, it's also available. Um, and then there are tons of smoke-free apps available. Quit Start is just one that I mentioned. I know it is a um, evidence-based program, but there are a ton available if you go to your app store. Um, I'm sure you could probably find one that's got a lot of great reviews. Um, so I would definitely check out smokefree.gov if you're interested in finding more information out about, um, about texting services that are available. Um, I see tons of questions and answers in the, in the chat, so I'm excited to see what everybody's got to say. Um, so I, I just want to share, I, I have, like I mentioned, there's my references, but I wanted to just talk for a second about um, resources and articles for further reading. I mentioned... Um, there is an article that first one listed is, uh, addresses how the tobacco industry um, uh, targets LGBTQ. Um, right below it is, is the website for Center for Black Health and Equity. If you have not, if you know nothing about this website, you should look into it. The CDC funds seven national networks and they all address different um, demographics. So there is one called Aspire that addresses Asian, uh, Asian American, Native American, and Pacific Islanders. And, and when I say addresses, they address tobacco use and dependence and tobacco-related illness with that group. Um, Geographic Health Equity Alliance is, uh, focuses on rural health. Again, Center for Black Health and Equity is, um, addresses African American. They focus a lot, very heavily, on uh, menthol use. Uh, no Menthol Sunday, if you've heard of that, that is um, part of Center for Black Health and Equities um, 
uh, one of their initiatives, excuse me. Um, also, there's the National Council for Behavioral Health. They focus on behavioral health and substance use disorders and smoking um, related illnesses with, um, for people who have those diagnoses. Um, the LGBT Cancer Network is um, obviously focuses on LGBTQ, um, uh, the LGBTQ community. Um, Our Voices Network is, um, works with Hispanic and Latino. And then the Self-Made Health Network wor works with low SES um, status folks and how the, tar the industry targets that group is, is a whole next, it's next level. Um, so I did not list them all on my PowerPoint, but if you want to Google um, CDC national networks, they will all pull up. It's a fantastic list. Also very great resource if you're interested in look, looking into them more. Um, and they're not paying me to say that. Um, there's a best practice user guide for health equity that I use probably twice a week. Um, there's a link for that too, also put together by CDC. Um, there's a PDF, you can download it. You probably don't wanna print it because it's several hundred pages long. Um, and then for health educators, I'm sorry, health healthcare providers, um, there are some PDFs there. Oh, my light went out again. Um, the Million Hearts Tobacco uh, Cessation Change Package is something else that we are working on using um, across the state. It focuses on uh, tobacco free campus policies for behavioral health care facilities, um, integrating screening and treatment in all behavioral and mental health care facilities, and, um, and really providing cessation services for mental and behavioral health care facilities. So, Finally, and then I will stop so we can answer questions. Um, there is a referral portal for the Tennessee Tobacco Quit Line. If you are a healthcare provider and want to go directly to the portal and um, refer people to, to the Quit Line, there's a link there, or you can visit tnquitline.com to get all of the information that you could ever want about the Quit Line. Finally, I will just say, this is my contact information please feel free to reach out. Um, the best way to contact me is via email. Um, I am terrible about answering my phone, um, but if you'd like to set up a call, um, I'm happy to do that. Also, if you need cessation brochures, materials, quick line cards, um, please feel free to, to shoot me an email. Um, if I don't have something that you're looking for, I can certainly help hunt it down. Um, yeah, so feel free to shoot me an email. I am. Um, Happy to help however I can. So I, I, I'm going to stop, and I don't know if someone else wants to read questions or if I need to just. I'm right here, Liz. And if oh. you'll do me a favor and um, and stop your screen share. Okay. And then. Um, Let me. Thanks. Great. There we go. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. What an amazing and uh, very eye-opening presentation. That was that, that was really awesome. Um, all right. Well, let's let, let's get started with some questions. Um, I was just scrolling through the chats to see if anybody had any questions. Gary asks if my dad wants me to bring or buy him a pack of cigarettes. Should I do it? Uh, so. I don't know. I mean, is, if P is a smoker and is, is you are hoping to help him quit, I, I, I don't know that I could answer that. I would say if he's looking to, if he's looking to quit or if, if it's you that's looking to quit, it's, it's, it's going to be really hard for him to quit if it's you that's pushing him to quit and he's not, he's got to have some buy-in there. So, um, you can always decline and say, you know, no, that's not going to be how I spend my money. And, and um, but I think that that certainly, if somebody wants to quit, they, they're going to have to have some kind of want, motivation, and drive to actually quit for themselves. It's really great that you're going to be there as a support person, we hope. Um, but I would say um, that's kind of a personal decision. And I think um, encouraging him to look into quitting is, is probably your best bet. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Melissa asks, why do lower income families have higher tobacco use rates nationally? The lower income families nationally, I mean, I can speak to Tennessee very, um, probably better, um, but Tennesseans, um, we are in the middle of a tobacco growing state. Oftentimes people who um, are, we have farmers who are growers and they are against 
turning down, you know, it's a also, it's also a generational thing, generations upon generations of smokers passing it down, social norms, all of these different things. And then also industry targets. I mean, they, they, if, if ever we had a tax increase on um, cigarettes, the industry would swoop in with tons of coupons and offer them to people. But it's, it's really industry tactics. It's generational, it's social norms. Um, there's a lot of different things that are compacted with, with why that happens. Sure. sure. Thank you. Um, does Tennessee receive, Melissa would also like to know if Tennessee receives stop funds for tobacco prevention in schools? I don't know what stop funds are. Um, so I can't, I don't know that I can answer that one. Okay. Um, Destiny would like to know why are there less prevention programs for smokers? Isn't tobacco use a drug that is important to help people manage? Yeah, absolutely. I think you just hit the nail on the head. There are not very many tobacco prevention programs. Um, there certainly now, I mean, e-cigarettes, uh, are kind of the new sexy and why what has brought attention back to tobacco prevention. Um, there is evidence that certainly um, after one year of a young person using electronic devices, they switch to tobacco use because it's easier, it's easier to access. So there are, um, there are several reasons, but also because we know that, and, and from what I have heard from some mental and behavioral healthcare providers that tobacco is not going to kill somebody right now. Like you know, an opi like opioid addiction, um, alcohol addiction, those things are not going to kill someone right now. 15 or 20 years down the road, certainly it could, it could kill someone. But um, I think that was like a question that I deal with every single day of there's, there's just really not enough attention being brought to tobacco use and prevention. Right. Even though it's just as deadly, if not more right. deadly than most of the other drugs, it just takes longer to kill you. Right. Um, Lucretia says, I'm so tired of African-Americans and other people of color being targeted for everything that is negative or they feel they are preyed upon. What are we doing to provide more education to the public about these issues that affect selected groups of people? So things like this. It's not very often that, that this message gets out there that they truly are being preyed upon. Um, I think the... Problem two is the amount of money that this industry, I, I can speak specifically to tobacco, um, that this industry has when they spend $2, billion, $2 million in in three days, there is no way that any prevention program can, can go to bat with that. Um, also just making people aware that this is an issue and that you know within your own local communities, it's also really difficult, almost impossible to pass local laws to protect citizens in our state um, and to allow people to um, you know, put up uh, or put bans on certain marketing and, and media stuff. So there are a lot of, of layers to why this happens specifically with tobacco. Sure. Um, Alisa would like to know, what do we know from research about the harmful effects of vapor from electronic devices? So um, I don't, there is, I will say what I have been told several times over, we don't have enough data on the harmful effects of electronic devices. I will say um, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention has said you know, in 10 years, we may have an electronic device that is um, made for cessation purposes for adults. We know that um, it is harm reduction for adults. For young people, any level of nicotine on the brain is incredibly harmful. And that's our problem here, is that these tobacco industries are preying on young people and with all these fruit flavors, all of the, you know, the different, uh, all of the different marketing and things that they are still able to do that's our problem is young people get addicted really, really young. And then they're switching to tobacco products, whether it be chew dips, nuts, snus, or, um, or, or cigarettes. Um, so we really don't know about the harmful effects of vaping at this point. We do know that every, all to, um, vape devices that have nicotine in them are still incredibly addictive and dangerous for young people to use. Uh, and I wonder just because you made the point, um, just talking about um, some of the donations made to eSig research. Um, I wonder if some of that data is even being withheld or, I mean, but you know, that's, that, that's kind of the point that you were making, which I think is really interesting. 
Yeah, around the um, data, around that research, I think that there is a... Let's see, Ashley wants to know, is there any legislation that is taking an active role in reducing the predatory marketing campaigns by Big Tobacco? And if so, how can we support those legislators? So we are a preempted state. Can you all hear me? I feel like I'm... Can, can you still hear me? Okay, great. We are a, without getting into the legislative um, aspects of this, and maybe this is something that Jack could talk with the coalition about, Jack, um, about preemption, tobacco preemption. Um, we are not allowed on the local level to pass any laws around, um, around media and marketing, um, and legislators don't really want to touch it with a 10-foot pole because they would have to repeal preemption before they're able to pass all these laws. Things can be passed at the state level, but most of the time, um, unless you get on board, if you can get a, a, um, a tobacco champion, there's a tobacco pre a couple of tobacco prevention champions who are legislators, legislators who could possibly in the next session pass some sort of law around um, media. And, and I could certainly give you some of those names, not maybe not now as this is being recorded, but um, I think it's really important for people to understand what it means to be a preemptive state and that we actually can't pass any laws at this point around marketing and promotion. Um, yeah. Hi Liz, this is Chloe. Austin got temporarily kicked off. We're not quite sure what's going on there, but there are there's so many questions. So let me get a few more in before our time's up. Okay. Uh, so uh, Kirby asked, like, as a former educator, I would like to know what drives you to serve as the director of tobacco control pro program? So what's your kind of <laughs> ignites you to keep going with this role? So I started in prevention and in, 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 at the Anti-Drug Coalition in Sumner County, and I um, was really driven um, because of the opioid crisis and working with, um, with young people and working with people my age who had um, not just um, opioid use, but also were smokers. And then I had an opportunity to come to the state and work specifically with tobacco. And I also have several family members. My grandmother died of COPD. I have a, a lot of connection to um, people who have been former smokers. Also, I am incredibly passionate about prevention of young, first initiation of use among young people. Um, I, I, I think that's really where it stems from. <laughs> So yeah, a lot of things <laughs> to really yeah. kind of move you forward with this charge. And so um, so Jennifer also asked to kind of go along with that. So what can she do as a university student to help friends who smoke? So I think certainly uh, talking with them about availability of services, I think it's hard as a young person to say like, because most young people think they're 10 foot tall and bulletproof and, and that they can quit easily and, and they're not going, they're not really that addicted. Um, and maybe that's not the case with you, but um, it's hard to say you should really quit smoking because it's going to do this to your skin or it's going to do that to your body. And, um, but I think trying to find ways to encourage them to quit smoking and how unhealthy it is, um, certainly letting them know that there are free resources available that, um, cause a lot of times that's the thing too, is, you know, I can't, as a, as a student, I don't, I can't afford nicotine replacement therapy. So many healthcare, either, um, student services, um, the quit line is free. Also, um, any health care, like health care insurances, most of the time, even if somebody has state Medicaid, TenCare, um, there's pretty very low co-pays involved in, in uh, looking at nicotine replacement therapy. So it's a hard, it's a hard thing, a task to take on to get your friends to quit smoking. And, and just, I think encouragement is always a good thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was, I mean, as you say, it's complex and it looks like Austin is back on. Um, <laughs> Liz, thank you so much. This yeah. was so informative. I can't believe how much I've learned this session and also the social injustices that go along with this. I had absolutely no idea. And so I think we've, all our eyes have been opened across the board. Right. <laughs> That's really part of my job too, is, is, is educating people on, on those types of things. So, um, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Also, if there are more questions and you guys want to reach out via email, please please feel free to do that. Okay, perfect. And attendees, I'm 